Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Joe, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I also want to express my gratitude to, to Dr. Fassbinder, who has really put in an enormous effort to make this happen. If you look into the audience, it is a success. So again, I, again, I want to thank everybody for being here today and for giving me an opportunity in this brief period of time to really talk about an area of research interest that we've had. I've been in, in focus on the area of vascular biology, particularly as it applies to tumor growth and development for 30 years. So it's always nice to see fresh ideas, and I owe a lot of that to my colleagues, who many of them are here today, and I'll acknowledge them as I, as I go on. But I'd like to really take you through a bit of a journey uh, to talk about this fascinating uh, response that perhaps most of you probably haven't heard of, but it probably is one of the most fundamental uh, processes that we encounter. So let me start by saying a few words about what I want to do today. I want to start out by talking about the role of the angiogenesis, the angiogenic response in health and disease. And I'll specifically focus on tumor angiogenesis because that's where the bulk of our work has been going on. I next would like to talk about and show you how the whole process of tumor angiogenesis is really important in potentiating tumor growth, tumor survival, and plays an important role in conferring drug resistance, not only on tumor cells, but also in host cells that are often in the presence of tumors. I'll also talk about the stress response, also known as the unfolded protein response, and where that sort of fits into this picture, or at least where we think it does. <coughs> and lastly, I'll talk about the role of the unfolded protein response and how we believe it potentiates tumor growth in two ways. It's involved in inducing drug resistance in tumor-associated endothelial cells, an important population of cells that obviously is instrumental for growing new blood vessels, but also in orchestrating a lot that goes on during tumor development. And finally, how this response is involved in stimulating tumor angiogenesis. So the, the, the fundamental problem we're really interested in is this, and that is the current survival rate of patients who suffer head and neck cancer, uh, and it continues to remain much, much of unchanged for the last 50 years. If you take a look, for example, uh, that worldwide about, about a half million new cases a year of this disease occurs, and about half of these people die um, from this disease within the first five years of diagnosis. And this is just an example. This you compare from 1975 to 2002. As you can see, during that period of time, uh, the prostate cancer has gone from a five-year survival rate a little above about 60% to one that, in fact, is close to 100%. So there's been marked improvement in a number of diseases, in typically prostate cancer. But oral cancer has largely remained unchanged. So our role is, is to how do we go about De de defining improvements to increase survival. And the only way really to do it is to define important biological mechanisms and to use that to base our therapy. So again, what I'll do today is talk about an important biological process and how we want to target that therapeutically as a means of treating cancer. So when you look at the hallmarks of cancer, and this is a slide recently published uh, by uh, Douglas Hanahan and and Robert Weinberg, that outlines what are the major features that define cancer hallmarks. And the one I want to focus in on today is angiogenesis, which is a very pivotal response during tumor development. So we'll start off by talking about the role of the angiogenic response in both health and disease. <coughs> now, there's really two faces to this process. On the one hand, we need angiogenesis for the developing embryo. And certainly, if we did not have developing blood vessels, we would never have a developing embryo. It's critically important in wound healing that the term granulation tissue re really refers to those capillary buds that really give the granular texture to the surface of a wound. And it's instrumental, obviously, in healing wounds. You also see it during bone healing and, little known, it's also important in hair growth. But angiogenesis also can, can play a destructive and pathologic role. For example, we often see it as contributing uh, to diseases such as the Kassebach-Merritt syndrome, where you get these large, literally systemic hemangiomas 
that can overwhelm and kill children at a very early age. They represent pure blood vessel growth uh, that is uncontrolled. Macular degeneration certainly is a disease in which one of the symptoms that you develop, the blindness, is due to the fact that you get new blood vessel growth in the back of the eye, that these tend to be leaky and they wind up destroying uh, the, uh, the rods and cones in the eye. And this represents showing you leaky blood caused by the new blood vessels. Certainly, it's important in cancer, and this is an example showing you a, 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 an image where there was a tumor developing in the breast of this woman. And finally, we also see angiogenesis when it doesn't function appropriately is actually particularly prolonged angiogenesis being a major contributing factor to diabetic wound healing or the lack thereof. So angiogenesis has both important physiologic uh, events that are important and without which we would not be able to function, but if left uncontrolled or unchecked, it can lead to disease uh, in, in a number of cases. So we'll talk about how does tumor angiogenesis potentiate tumor growth, and really how, how does it involve in both the survival and tumor vessel drug resistance. So the paradigm of which this whole um, study is, occurs is really the paradigm that was laid out a number of years ago by Judah Folkman, <coughs> who, who developed the, who made this concept that tumors are angiogenesis dependent, that without blood vessels, tumors would not grow. And the diagram shows that quite nicely, that following somatic mutation, one frequently gets a small collection of tumor cells that remain dormant. So they exist undetected in the tissues, and they may exist like that for years. However, at some point in time, an event called the angiogenic switch occurs, and I'll show you what that is in a moment. And what happens, you begin to secrete a number of angiogenic factors that begin to stimulate tumor growth until eventually you go from an undetectable growth to one that's three-dimensional. And this three-dimensional growth is attributed due to the fact is that you get this large, massive blood vessels that are growing into the tumor. This is growth caused by the tumor itself as well as the surrounding host tissue. So the goal is, targeting angiogenesis therapeutically, is to revert back to perhaps a dormant phenotype where you actually can inhibit blood vessel growth. We'll talk about what, the tu what happens in the tumor environment that makes that a very difficult process. Now, we talked about the angiogenic switch, and uh, I, this is a publication that uh, I put, was participated in uh, with Fazan Rastanajad, who was then a PhD student and a colleague, Noel Bauk, who really defined the whole concept of the angiogenic switch. And what that concept is, is that there's always a balance between inhibitors and stimulators. And when that becomes out of balance, one gets sustained blood vessel growth. And that can occur a number of ways. One is that you get an excessive production of stimulators of blood vessel growth that sort of overwhelms whatever inhibitors are present, or you actually get inhibitors being shut down and not being, not being produced at all. So any low level of stimulators will actually affect new blood vessel growth. We also know that angiogenesis is an early indicator of neoplastic progression. And this shows you in this cartoon that really at a stage where you're getting early clonal expansion of dysplastic, probably early neoplastic cells, that you can actually detect new blood vessel growth. And finally, this will persist. This may be us at low levels for weeks or months before it results in overwhelming growth into the tumor. And this is an example of a section of a tumor that's dysplastic in which you can see CD34 labeled endothelial cells showing how much blood vessel growth is actually occurring even in this lesion that is yet to invade into the surrounding tissue. So we see angiogenesis being very fundamentally important early on in the development of tumors. So again, it represents a potentially important target for therapy. So a number of years ago, um, more than I'd like to remember, uh, Jacques Nor was then a PhD student in my laboratory and made a very interesting observation. The fun part about doing science is that the most interesting part and the most exciting things are the things you just don't expect. So Jacques made the observation that when endothelial cells uh, were exposed to uh, vascular endothelial growth, a known potent stimulator of blood vessel growth, there was also an increase in expression of an important survival protein, BCL2. This cartoon shows you that VEGF is really composed of several uh, similarly uh, structured molecules, but at the end, all of them, one way or another, are involved in stimulating blood vessel growth. But most importantly, at least a number of these can actually stimulate 
this important survival protein, BCL2. So, so Jacques then tried to determine what the link was between VEGF and BCL2, and how do they relate to one another with regard to tumor angiogenesis. So he did a number of experiments, and I'll sort of summarize everything in this one slide. Uh, he, we developed a model system in the lab in which we actually took human blood vessel cells, incorporated them into a, a, an artificial matrix, and implanted them into a mouse. And over time, what you would see is that you'd see the human endothelial cells turning into blood vessels that would connect up with mouse cells. And this is an example of, uh, of a human endothelial cell. Half this vessel is mouse right here, and the other half is made up of human endothelial cells. So what he did was he did a, 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 a considerable amount of work. But th in this one experiment, the question was, what would happen if you now there was a link between VEGF and BCL. What would happen now if you transduced or introduced BCL2 express at high levels in endothelial cells? What would happen? And so what this shows you is that certainly when you do do that, you introduce endothelial cells overexpressing BCL2 with the tumor, that you get significant increase in blood vessels that are overexpressing this particular protein. So the protein appears to be involved in stimulating blood vessel growth. But in addition, you get significant, much more significant growth of both these two, two one is a squamous carcinoma, the other one is a Kaposi's sarcoma, both in terms of tumor volume and tumor weight. So when blood vessels were expressing this particular survival protein, they were producing significant more tumor growth. And this shows you what it looks like. Here it represents tumors that are freshly implanted, that are implanted without blood vessels, and here are the same tumor, in this case implanted with blood vessel cells containing the survival protein. So there was an exponentially large increase in growth due to the fact is that the endothelial cells were now expressing the survival protein at a much higher level. So he made the important link that was not only vascular endothelial growth factor important for stimulating blood vessel growth, but it had an even more important role in maintaining the survival of endothelial cells and sustaining neovascularization. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't show up very well, but BCL2, looking down the road, has a number of important factors. One is, is it can help actually define neosplastic potential. Now, what this shows you here is the percentage of endothelial cells expressing this particular survival protein in normal tissue. And this represents in a lymph node of a patient who has cancer but has not yet metastasized to the lymph node. So what it suggests is that you're apt, able to activate endothelial cells at distant sites systemically with tumors. And this shows you lymph nodes that contain tumors that have an even higher rate of BCL2 expression in the endothelial cells. So what this says is, is that the endothelial cells now have a distinct survival advantage due to the fact is that they're expressing this survival protein. And put in that the context of tumor development, what it says is, is that it's now able to sustain tumor growth for a much longer period of time. So the question is, is this a potential target for therapy? Well, our early indication that it might be came with another study that uh, Jacques did. And we were trying to look at the role of BCL2 plays in, in how it actually, in how some of these inhibitors of angiogenesis actually functioned. And these represent thrombospondin 1, IP10, endostatin. These are well known inhibitors of blood vessel growth that, in some cases, have been thought to be potentially used therapeutically. So this represents when normal endothelials are exposed, for example, to thrombospondin, in this fluorometric unit, the amount of death that's occurring. Uniformly, most of the blood vessel cells in a culture dish that are exposed to this particular inhibitor will die by undergoing apoptosis. However, if we take these same blood vessel cells, first expose them to vascular endothelial growth factor, which, as you know, now increases PCL2, what you find is they don't die quite as readily, so they become resistant. So again, this is one of the early studies showing that endothelial cells or blood vessel cells that, uh, that are expressing BCL2 really become resistant now to the pro-apoptotic or death effects that are associated with naturally occurring inhibitors of angiogenesis. So this is our first indication that there was something here to look at. So there are a number of models of how tumors and tumor cells in the microenvironment become resistant. The first is called evasion. 
And what that means is, for example, there may be upregulation of alternate proangiogenic signals. So let's say you develop a target molecule for VEGF, and you target that to inhibit blood vessel growth. Well, what the tumor does often is switch to produce a different type of an inhibitor to overcome that suppression of that one. So you'll have upregulation of alternative stimulators of blood vessel growth that will overwhelm whatever inhibitor strategy you're using. There's also recruitment of progenitor cells. So we know, for example, that a certain amount of blood vessel growth occurs not only from pre-existing blood vessels that are there, but they actually recruit cells from the bone marrow to differentiate into endothelial cells. So you can imagine if this stimulation is robust enough that they could literally, every time you're killing one cell, you're replacing it with two or three new ones coming from the bone marrow. So potentially, recruitment from the bone marrow can overwhelm the system. Again, by increasing pericyte coverage, you actually shield the endothelial cell from some of these inhibitors. And again, you can increase the capacity of invasion without angiogenesis. Uh, finally, you can preferentially act, as we've shown, pro-survival pathways such as BCL2. The other way is indifference. They become refractory to many of these signals. They just don't respond to these inhibitors. There is actually pre-existing inflammatory cell mediated protection. So one of the things, as you well know, that as a tumor grows, it begins to co-opt the normal biological processes to use to their own advantage. So whereas the inflammatory response is normally has a protective and repetitive role, during tumor development, it actually has a role in stimulating tumors and really protecting the tumor environment in a pro-stimulatory way. Again, hypovascularity and a difference towards particular inhibitors, tumors will just suddenly become refractory to these inhibitors. And finally, co-opting normal vessels, which by their very nature tend to be uh, less susceptible to these inhibitors. So again, there are a number of different strategies, ways that tumors become resistant. Our focus is on the survival mechanisms, and can we alter that somehow? So here's an example of what we wanted to do. And again, as you're trying to define new therapies, you have to work down through and define the mechanism in as much detail as possible to find the most, uh, to find that one particular area that in that signaling pathway to target to be the most efficient way of dealing with these. So one of the things we did was to try and define what are the signaling pathways through which vascular endothelial growth factor was working, and perhaps BCL2. And in this picture, it just shows you in this graph, this represents the percentage of surviving endothelial cells in a culture dish in this case here. Again, when you irradiate endothelial cells, they certainly a significant number of these cells die. And that's one of the things you typically see with radiation damage, that there's a lot of endothelial death. However, when they're exposed to vascular endothelial growth factor, they're less susceptible to that same death. If we somehow inhibit the PI3 kinase pathway and the MAP kinase, and two important signaling pathways through which VEGF actually works, it begins to look more like those that were not treated. So it suggests that vascular endothelial growth factors protection works through these important signaling pathways. So it opens up opportunities now to target some of these intermediate steps. Again, we were able to show that this, in fact, was linked to expression of this survival protein, BCL2. Again, when we wind up uh, using these uh, signaling inhibitors, and these are chemical inhibitors that block different pathways or different components of the pathway, it could show you that, once again, when you ex expose endothelial cells to BCL2, you get the number of BCL2-positive vessels, but when you wind up using inhibitors of VEGF and BCL2, you, you essentially revert back to, to what they look like as untreated. So it looks as though when you block the PI3 kinase, not only do you interfere with VEGF expression, but most importantly, you block expression of BCL2, which you don't see here. So we're now we're able to link VEGF through a signaling pathway to BCL2, but we weren't done yet because we knew that there were probably other important events occurring. So we went on to further examine this signaling pathway, and again, this is work that's done over a four or five year period, and eventually we came to the, we came to the realization that the key signaling pathways also involve RAP, ERK, and survivin, an important protein downstream of this. So we linked now the entire pathway and found that actually the target protein that we may want to think about looking at is survivin. So again, without belaboring the point, you know, we started out with radiating endothelial cells. Uh, and found out that vascular endothelial growth actually did protect from radiation-induced damage by impacting 
these different intermediate signaling pathways. So again, defining the mechanism allowed us to hone in on the important biological properties and the important molecular events that we needed to consider therapeutically. So what does this mean in terms of tumor growth? And essentially, now we said, if the, th the thought is, if we would now combine uh, these signaling inhibitors that we knew would target BCL2 and survivin, along with some conventional therapy, could we affect more efficiently tumor growth and, or, and actually use lower doses of some of these chemotherapeutic agents? Uh, again, one of the problems you typically see with many agents, whether it be radiation therapy or chemotherapy is that you often have severe side effects because it's indiscriminate. It, it'll kill most rapidly dividing cells, including cell populations such as oral mucosa, which turns over quite rapidly. So the thought is, if we would use these signaling inhibitors and block surviving in BCL2 as an adjunct therapy, perhaps we could use lower concentration of some of these chemotherapeutic agents to affect the same um, therapy. So again, what we did show eventually is that when you combined, uh, when you combined cisplatinum and radiation along with uh, this signal, you could essentially ablate tumor volume at half the dose, not shown here, half the dose of these chemotherapy and half the radiation dose. So in this animal model, we were able to show that we could target, in this case, an important survival protein with no affected blood cells and that it enabled us to use uh, lower doses of both radiation and chemotherapy drugs to affect, at least in the experimental model, efficient tumor therapy. And in the, in the human, the goal is just to minimize the side effects. So this is our first for this. And we can also show that this is largely due to the fact is that we were suppressing blood vessel growth. So again, looking at untreated in a tumor, and then finally tumors that are treated with both radiation, cisplatin, and this inhibitor of PA3 kinase, we could actually shut down blood vessel growth. So we were shown that much of the inhibition we were looking at was targeted to the blood vessels. So the evidence we had at this time, and it certainly has been confirmed in many other laboratories, that vascular endothelial growth factor through BCL2 potentiated angiogenesis cell survival and drug resistance, and by targeting intermediates, we could overcome this resistance phenotype. So where does the cellular or the unfolded protein response fit into the picture? Well, let's tell a little bit about what stress does or doesn't do. Stress response is certainly something that occurs in many different environments. Certainly, it's important physiologically. Certainly, we also think of, whoops, think of stress as being certainly pathologic, but we know it plays an important role in program cell death. So anytime you have a physiologic response, you know, that causes stress in the cell, that demands the cell increased protein turnover, protein production, you introduce a stressful environment. We also know that inability to respond appropriately to stress can lead to tissue damage and disease. For example, we see this in aberrant wound healing and diabetes mellitus, where the stress response is incapable of, of correcting, to be corrected. And we also see this where you accumulated unfolded and misfolded proteins, for example, in Alzheimer's. So typically what happens in a cell when it's stressed, there's two forms, either acute or chronic. When it's acute stress, a machinery is put into place to deal with that, that we define as the unfolded protein response. So as we sort of look at this response, we know that cell stress or uncontrolled stress is associated with obesity. We know it plays a key role in diabetes. Cystic fibrosis and viral infections can also be attributed to activation of this unfolded protein response and cell stress. Certainly, prion disease, Alzheimer's disease, and none of the neurodegenerative disorders can be attributed to unfolded protein response disorders. And finally, cancer and drug resistance. So where does this all occur? It occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. That's the site for where this unfolded protein response or stress response is activated. And again, some of the things that can induce stress, obviously, as again, we often see nutrient deprivation, starvation, calcium imbalance, or hypoxia. Typically, what you see in a tumor is a very stressful response. You can also get it when there's defective protein degradation, where proteins accumulate in the cell and are not, do not, are not uh, transported into the proteasome where they're degraded. 
or you can accumulate unfolded or misfolded proteins. So when a protein is produced, it has to have appropriate disulfide bonds, it's got to be glycosylated, and it's got to be folded in a three-dimensional way that enables it to function. Many times when a cell is stressed, what happens is that these proteins begin to accumulate. And so when unfolded proteins begin to accumulate, it initiates what we call uh, the stress response. You typically see this, as I said, in tumors. And this is a diagram. This shows you a center of hypoxia in a tumor. So the, the living cells are located here, but this is essentially a dead tumor. You typically see it in tumor blood vessel growth, where there's often, there's often areas of occlusion, there's AV shunts, there's breaks in the vessel. So the vessels and the tumors are often under severe stress. Yet, we typically see tumors growing and thriving in this stressful environment. So the question is why? Well, as I said, the way it's taken care of is this process called the unfolded protein response. And really what it represents is a series of signaling pathways, each of which either work together or independently to correct or minimize stress. Uh, again, the, the, perhaps the phylogenetically, the one that's uh, most conserved is what they call the IRE1. This is the inositol requiring protein pathway. But all of them, at some point in time, produce transcription factors. And these transcription factors actually regulate expression of genes. Some of these genes are involved in resupplying these proteins in this response. Other of these are involved in driving cells to either die, if the proteins cannot be refolded, or to survive. So the question is, what are the mechanisms by which survival is ensured or accounted for by this unusual response? So when the tumor is stressed, there's several options to it. Number one, it can activate NF-kappa B and protect this, or it can activate caspases and cause cell death. It can force cells into G1RS so it protects them, so they stop growing, so they don't accumulate additional stressful. It can actually activate P38 and drive cells, tumor cells into dormancy. Or in some respects, there's a possibility it actually can increase VEGF secretion, so it increases the blood supply that enables tumors to survive. So the tumor has a number of options of how it can survive, and many of these options are regulated by the unfolded protein response, but we know very little about how it works. So what I'll do is talk a little bit about some data that we've had in our laboratory that suggests some mechanisms of how this might work. So, we had, our hypothesis is, is that depending upon the type of stress in this vascularized tumor, that naive endothelial cells, particularly under chronic stress, learn to adapt. So they adapt to the stressful environment. And this adaptation is translated into resistance. So these endothelial cells are now resistant to the stressful environment that's caused by hypoxia, caused by inflammatory cell populations that target the tumor, and they survive and continue to, to grow. So, the thing is to design experiments to see if this is the case. So Fernanda Viasoli, who was in our laboratory for a year, did a number of experiments uh, looking at an aspect of stress, in this case looking at as acidosis. Now as you know, tumors are often in an acidic environment. They're usually bathed in lactic acid, primarily because of the Wahlberg effect. And what that is is that tumors often use glycolysis to generate energy for survival because they often are in a hypoxic environment. So the production of lactic acid is important, but it causes an acidic environment which the tumor cells are able to thrive in. So what this shows you is, and I know it's probably a little bit too small, but a number of different components. Uh, the glucose response protein 78 is activated. We see the act activating transcription factor 4. We see the uh, a number of different proteins part of this that appear to be activated when cells are exposed to an acidic environment, either due to lactic acid, or in this case, by just adding hydrochloric acid in a culture dish with endothelial cells. So again, it shows you that there is marked increase in expression of a number of proteins that we define as being part of this unfolded protein response. So we know they're up. We're not sure what they're doing yet. And again, showing you that the Xbox binding protein is spliced. All of these indicating that we've activated the response. We also know that if we take tumors and grow them in a culture dish and allow their media to become acidic, rather than adding acid directly to it, we see the same thing. Once again, we see activation of a number of different 
components of the unfolded protein response. And we see a very similar picture here with acidified tumor condition media just caused by tumors sitting in, in, in the culture dish and allowing them to use, spend their, expend their media. So tumor condition media behaves very similar to pure acid that's added, suggesting that the tumor itself is capable of generating and activating the, this particular response in blood vessel cells. And again, um, what this shows you is that chronic exposure does in fact cause drug resistance. So let me just show you here. This represents etoposide, adriamycin, and sunutinib, which is an anti-angiogenic inhibitor used and currently used in drug therapy. And what it shows you that in fact many of these cells, and this represents relative vessel cells, number of cells that are surviving, they actually are protected. So unlike control cells, which die, these tend to be protected in these three drugs. We see that with both exposure to lactic acid as well as when exposed to acid. So cells that are exposed to this, the unfolded protein response confers protection on these cells uh, in, when exposed to this stressful condition. Again, we also know that if you knock down an important member of this using short hairpin RNA, which actually inhibits uh, translation initiation, that we begin to see cells becoming resensitized. And again, what, uh, unfortunately, this doesn't show up particularly well, but again, the protection that was afforded initially is now gone. So again, if we block just one of these important regulars, and what's important about GRP78 or this glucose binding protein is that it's key to initiate the entire response. Once it binds, the response is initiated. So we know if you block the response, you now reverse the protection phenotype. Again, another important aspect is, is that is in terms of caspase. This is a series of enzymes that when a cell uh, is programmed to die, caspase is activated. And this shows you here that in acidified media that you don't get caspase activation. So once again, it shows, it shows that when protection occurs, what's happening is that you've diverted cells from a pro-apoptotic or cell death environment to one that's survival. We also know, and we, another hypothesis was that perhaps the unfolded protein response was instrumental in inducing angiogenesis. So here our hypothesis is not only do we deal with cells that are therapeutic resistant, but these stem cells, are, because of that, are able to contribute and stimulate tumor growth as a result of activating the unfolded protein response. So. Here's an example of what we typically see. This is work I'll show you now is work done by Do uh, Dr. Yugang Wang, who's in my laboratory, and Galita Alam, two postdocs currently in the lab. So Yugang was able to uh, demonstrate here examples of uh, a, a number of proteins that are expressed in tumor cells but not expressed or, or marginally expressed in normal tissue. So we know that in tumors that many of these proteins are expressed and can be seen immunohistochemically. So one of the things he did is that by exposing tumor cells to a variety of stressful conditions, whether it be glucose deprivation using chemicals such as thapsgarin or tunicomycin, which will cause stress, that one of the things he found which was quite interesting was, first of all, that you get an upregulation of, of a number of proangiogenic mediators. And you can see them here. This is a, again, this is an expression profile, gene expression profile, showing you a fold increase at four and 24 hours, you can see there is a, a, a considerable increase, particularly in vascular endothelial growth factor when cells are under stress. But what's even more interesting is that we see an, an opposite effect on these inhibitors of angiogenesis where they're dropped quite significantly. So this gene array suggested that the unfolded protein response can, act, can on the one hand, upregulate or is associated with the upregulation of stimulators of angiogenesis, but it's also similarly located with the downregulation of inhibitors. So, is, so the question we ask, is there co-regulation of these two important arms of the angiogenic response that we can attribute to the unfolded protein response? So again, uh, looking at some experiments, this shows you by using glucose, decreasing concentration of glucose, that you activate a number of these particular molecules. Uh, and again, you can see that, again, with glucose deprivation, you activate CHOP, GRP78, and this activating transcription factor 4. 
But also when you take a look either by ELISA or RT-PCR, you see there are certainly is an increase, significant increase in vascular endothelial growth factor, IL-6, and fibroblast growth factor too, all three of which can stimulate blood vessel growth. Again, when you're looking at using quantitative PCR, you see a very similar thing. You see increases in VEGF, IL-6, and fibroblast growth factor too, and again, in cells that have been exposed and deprived of glucose, so that are under stress. And again, looking at condition media from glucose-derived tumor cells, we also see that it is more potently capable of stimulating uh, blood vessel growth. So again, not only does, do we link now resistance to the unfolded protein response, in this case using acidic condition media, now we, can, now we, now we know that when the, there's activation of the unfolded protein response, that we see a concomitant increase in stimulators of blood vessel growth as well as a downregulation of inhibitors, which would make sense if, in fact, this is playing an active role in maintaining tumor growth. We also know that HIF-1-alpha, HIF-1-alpha is an important enzyme that is activated with hypoxia. As a matter of fact, many years ago, it was, it was shown that, for example, when you activate HIF-1-alpha, you can actually stimulate vascular endothelial growth factor production. And there's a disease called the von Hippel-Lindau syndrome in which people lack this gene and therefore they overproduce HIF-1-alpha and they overproduce vascular endothelial growth factor. So there are molecular defects that specifically target this particular um, protein. But we also know is that apparently it, it's, doesn't, it's not required for uh, the ability of the unfolded protein response to activate antigenic production. We know, for example, here uh, that when you, um, in this case, this you use a short hair pin RNA to downregulate HIF-1 alpha, you do get growth of, uh, you do get activation of some of the unfolded protein response. But most importantly here, even if you knock down HIF-1 alpha, you don't affect the ability of glucose to activate production of vascular endothelial growth factor. So it's an independent process, so it's not required. Now again, Another important arm is PERC, and we showed you that PERC actually, there's two ways that it responds to stress. When you activate this particular enzyme, when it's acute stress, it actually shuts down translation, and it does that in the cell so the cell stops producing excessive amounts of protein and allows it to be transported out of the cell or be refolded. However, in those cases where the stress is chronic, um, it, can, it activates a series of transcription factors. So one of the things we found out here is that when you knock down PERC, again, using these RNA interference, and again, this is untreated and treated, this is untreated and this is the knockdown, exposed to either 0.5 or 2 millimolar glucose, what you see here is that, again, that you wind up knocking down, when you knock down this particular component of the unfolded protein response, you knock down an important transcription factor and it's associated with a decrease in production of vascular endothelial growth factors. So it suggests that this particular arm of the response is key to production of this stimulator. Again, similarly, if you knock down the most distal element of this particular pathway, ATF4, you essentially see the same thing, a decrease both in PCR and ELISA in, in production of vascular endothelial growth factors. So, now trying to fine tune now our experiments to find out which pathway is most important. It appears that this pathway is really critical production of these of the stimulators of blood vessel growth. And again, we went and took one step further and we have cells that, in which the gene has been totally knocked out and essentially we see the same thing. We see here in PERC knockout cells that whether in, that glucose is reduced, I mean, that, that vascular endothelial growth factor RNA is reduced significantly. So again, again, we now have a path that we think we can now begin to think about targeting, you know, in terms of targeting blood vessel growth during tumor development. But again, I also want to show you um, some recent work, this done by Galita, in which she looked at the opposite end, the inhibitors of angiogenesis, in which this shows you here in a tumor cell that when you expose a tumor cell, in this case, to deprivative glucose for 24 hours, you get a reduction in the production of thrombospondin 1 RNA. However, the same stimulus will lead to a production and overproduction of stimulators. And this shows you here in these blots that, in fact, 
you do reduce significantly the amount of thrombospondin, but while you activate these members of the unfolded protein response. So we're, again, we're carefully beginning to dissect through this, this pathway to try and better understand how we can target blood vessels. So if we sort of look at an expanded version of that diagram that uh, Hannah Hannah and Winder had, what this is, these represent potential targets. So where does the unfolded protein response fit in here? One, it certainly is important in cell death or resisting cell deaths. So perhaps by targeting this, we can reverse uh, and, and make cells much more susceptible to stimuli that would cause cell death. We also know that it's directly involved in stimulating vascular endothelial growth factor production. So this represents, again, using the single target, here's another arm of this response that we may target in tumor therapy. And lastly, uh, the unfolded protein response can have a direct effect on cell proliferation. So in theory, we have a, a pathway that allows us to look at three independent processes all involved in sustaining tumor growth. So perhaps by targeting this, we'd be able to affect each of these important elements that are involved in tumor cell proliferation or tumor cell growth. So in summary, what we've shown, I believe, is that angiogenesis does promote tumor progression in a couple of ways. One is it directly stimulates tumor growth and it contributes to therapeutic resistance. So on the one hand, you can feed tumors with all the nutri nutrients it needs to grow three-dimensionally, but those endothelial cells that line those blood vessels become resistant to chemotherapeutic agents. So it's truly swimming upstream therapeutically. We also shown that tumors are able to adapt to chronic stress. So no, despite the fact is they're in an acidic environment, that they're often nutrient deprived, they're often under constant assault by the host, they seem to survive. And they do this by facilitating adaptation through chronic stress. And they do this by promoting angiogenesis to actually alleviate nutrient deprivation and by conferring drug resistance to populations in and around the tumor, in this case, endothelial cells that comprise an important part of the tumor microenvironment. So what is the model that we're working on in the laboratory? And it is this, that the unfolded protein response, on the one hand, can directly upregulate stimulators of blood vessel growth and downregulate inhibitors. By activating BCL2, it can lead to drug resistance. So this has several different ways. This, so this confers this, an advantage on tumor cells in many different ways. And perhaps by targeting this, many of these axes, it may be a fruitful way of actually looking at tumor therapy. But I really have to thank the people who have done the hard work. First, Jacques Noor, who's been a colleague and a collaborator for a number of years who's really doing some of the most critical work in the area of vascular biology that affects tumor development. Uh, Andrew Fribley, who was a, a laboratory member of uh, Kunyu Wong before he went to UCLA and now had been a postdoc in Randy Kaufman's laboratory, was really instrumental in helping us learn about the things we need to about the unfolded protein response. Pawan Kumar was with me for several years and did some of the early studies linking BCL2 and Survivrin to drug resistance. And my current group in the laboratory, Yugang Wang, Galita Alam, and Fernanda Viasoli, uh, who really have done most of the latter half of this work that represents an exciting new area for us to think about therapeutically. Finally, Yu Ying, who's in my lab, and Zhu Dong Dong, who's in Dr. North laboratory. And with that, I thank you very much. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.